it looks like I have a little helper right now. So, hey Tess. Today I am talking about autism and specifically I am talking about the signs of autism in very young children. Now, not children like Tessie. I've talked about that before. I've talked a lot about the signs of autism in kids who are Tessie's age and toddlers. Today I want to talk about the signs of autism that we saw with Tessie when she was an infant. Now, when Tessie was an infant, I had a lot of people tell me that, are you on my back? That's not what they told me. I had a lot of people tell me that I could not know that she was autistic and that it was impossible to know that early and that we weren't seeing signs because there weren't signs, that there weren't signs in babies under 18 months. It was impossible to know at that point and that, I don't know. Oh, I see what you want. <laughs> Test the best. So I was told a lot that I couldn't know that my baby was autistic and sorry, thumbprint. So I was told a lot that I couldn't know that my baby was autistic even though I knew that she was and I kept saying that and when she was one month old, actually the first time I remember when Tessie was in the hospital after she was born, we were there for four days and I was pretty sure she didn't like to be touched. She didn't like to be held. She cried when we were holding her. She stopped when I put her down. I'd been through this before with her sister. I, not at all to this extreme level, but it was just something that was familiar enough that I had a feeling that by the time we took her home from the hospital, I was feeling pretty confident that she was going to be on the spectrum. It was really hard because I wanted to do something right away. It was like, we have this baby and I know that she is autistic and I just, I wanted to be able to do something to make it easier for her. I knew that when she became a toddler, she was gonna be frustrated and I just, I wanted to help her communicate like from the very beginning. And so I started reaching out to everybody I knew. And if you're somebody who knew me at that time, you know that by the time she was a month old, I had probably told all of Maggie's therapists, everybody who'd ever worked with Maggie or helped Maggie like, hey, there's this baby. And I'm pretty sure she's on the autism spectrum. In fact, I'm positive. Um, what would you recommend? If, if she was your baby, what would you do? And so everyone was giving me tips and everyone was giving us help and just giving us ideas. But what most people said was, you really can't know, she's too little. And I was like, I didn't say this, but in my head I was like, I know, I know. When she went to her first neurology appointment, she was a few months old because she was sleeping all the time and she was really not very responsive. And her pediatrician knew our family history and her pediatrician was pretty sure and believed us. And then we took her to a neuro neurologist. Now her neurologist was also, is also James's neurologist. He's also Maggie's neurologist. And he met her when she was a few months old and he put down in her chart autism spectrum disorder when she was a few months old, which made a lot of other doctors pretty annoyed because they're like, they'd see it in her chart and be like, you can't have that. She, she's only a few months old. You can't know that. We were pretty sure. And so today that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about why we were so sure. Why when she was five days old, I went into a meeting with Maggie's social worker and speech therapists and OTs and said, with Tessie wrapped up on my chest and I said, I'm pretty sure that this baby's autistic. And I know, I think everybody probably thought I was crazy and they're all amazing people, but it's that people don't hear that. They don't hear that babies that small are on the spectrum. However, the reason I'm talking about this here is that I've also heard from a lot of other parents, especially parents who have older siblings, who've been through the same thing, who have a second child and who see the same signs and who are like, I know, I know that this baby is also on the spectrum. And who, <laughs> hey you. What's that? What you gonna do with it? Ooh, ooh. Can you say, yeah. what happened? What happened? Yeah, good girl. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. 
So, I want to talk about the main signs that we saw when she was tiny that told us that she was on the spectrum when she was a tiny baby. I'm talking about when she was a newborn, when she was so tiny, when she was the littlest of the little. Because now she is three and she was diagnosed with autism when she was 18 months old and when she was 20 months old, they did the ADAS again to confirm it and they did it again when she was three because our insurance reconfirms it every single year and she scores a 10 out of 10 on that ADOS. Because we're all for perfect Eight. scores. So Tessie definitely is on the autism spectrum. Uh. And so now I'm gonna tell you how I knew it the day that she was born, or at least within the first four days of her life, why I knew without a doubt. <sighs> because believe me, I wouldn't have been making phone calls to tell people that I thought my baby was autistic unless I was positive and I was that sure. And that's what we're talking about today. The first sign for us, and again, everyone's different. Not all kids on the spectrum are gonna have these signs, but I think it's important to share because I've heard from other parents that their kids did. And so some kids are gonna have this in common. And I believe that it's something that you actually can see with some newborns, probably definitely not all, but some kids on the spectrum do show signs at a far earlier age than we are diagnosing at this point. And I think it can be really helpful for parents just before you're losing your mind wondering what is going on when you have a toddler that is just having a really, really hard time and is really frustrated with their lack of ability to communicate with you. For us, it was really helpful to know from a really early age that communication was going to be different than it was with a neurotypical child. And for us, knowing that early was really helpful, even if other people didn't really believe us. And Tessie was an early intervention at three months old. So that getting that help, that was helpful too. So let's start off with the signs that we saw. <laughs> Sorry, I know I keep on adding more and more and it's because I have so much to say about this. I think that it can help so many people and it's something that I'm really passionate about. So number one, she hated to be touched. Um, touch aversion is something that you see a lot with some people who are on the spectrum. Not everybody, but some people. And it's usually light touch. So here's the thing. Most babies like being held by their moms. Most babies like being cuddled and held and laid on their mom's chests. And that's kind of what newborns do. They sleep and they eat and they sleep and they eat. Only the thing with Tessie was when she was on my chest, she didn't want to be on my chest. She wanted to be in her bassinet she wanted to be swaddled and she wanted to be not being touched or bothered or anything. And she wasn't happy being held by me or Paul. And when she was down, she was super, super happy. But being held, she was uncomfortable with that. And it was gonna be like that for the next probably close to two years. Tessie sits with you and Tessie is really, really cuddly now, but um, it's probably still not really the thing where you initiate cuddles with Tessie. If I pick her up, she usually wants to get down pretty fast. Tessie cuddles you, you don't cuddle Tessie. And she's super, super cuddly now. Like I go over there and I lay down and she's probably gonna come over and cuddle me and kiss me and hug me and be like a little ball of joyful cuddles. So that's number one. She didn't like to be touched. And that was from the day she was born. She didn't like to be held, which kind of segues into number two, which is she liked being down in her bassinet by herself almost all the time. That was where she was happiest. That was where she was in her element. If we picked her up, there was a good chance she was gonna start crying. We put her down and she would stop. So that's quick. I don't, I can't really say much more to it than that. She seemed really, really content in her playpen, in her bassinet especially. She didn't like being near us. I knew that that was not typical. So that was another huge sign. 
Number three was she wouldn't look at my face. So this was super early and it was kind of further confirmation for what I already expected. It was about two weeks. She was two weeks old and I thought, you know what? Two week old babies don't always make eye contact, but two week old babies also don't usually like try to look away from you when you make eye contact with them. So I'd be nursing it. I would be nursing her and I would be looking down at her and she would be like taking her eyes and looking away from me with her eyes, like straining her little two week old eyes to not look at me already. When she was that little, it was that, it was that much of an aversion. And as she got older, it got to be more and more of a thing. By the time she was a month old, it was very, very, very clear that when she was nursing, she would do everything in her power to not be looking at my face. And so that for me was a big sign and Maggie never done anything like that. One of the people that I talked to said, well, she loves it. She does like it when you sing to her. She would make little sounds and she would be the most animated when I would sing. So I said, well, why don't you sing with her, sing to her and be like right over her. And like when she makes eye contact with you, sing. And if she looks away, stop. So we tried that just to like see if it would work. And it worked for a a day and then she very very quickly realized that if she looked at my forehead it was really hard for me to tell the difference between forehead and eyes and it just she hated making eye contact that much that she as a tiny baby was already figuring out ways to avoid it and so we were kind of like okay yeah this is really real she didn't want to make eye contact but there was more Despite the fact that she apparently had the eye control to not make eye contact and to like look to the side to avoid looking at me, when early on came over, which is our state's early intervention program, to try to work with her to, to evaluate her, they had like black and white toys that were, you know, interesting to babies and they went back and forth over her head and she wasn't tracking at all. She just laid there and she didn't move. So developmentally she was already way behind at this point we're talking about three months old. at three months old she was already missing major milestones um, at three months old you don't have to miss that many milestones to be way behind so that is our next one she was missing a lot of milestones like she wasn't tracking with her eyes I think that the next one can go either way. Kind of like the first one. I think that some some little kids who are on yeah. the spectrum, you hear, thank you, Tessie, yeah. you agreeing with me? I hear about little kids who want to be held all the time and little kids who don't want to be held at all. It seems like a lot of times there's, there's extremes. Like parents talk about their kids who have super, super high needs that end up being on the spectrum and kids who have super, super low needs that end up being on the spectrum. That is usually, the stories that I usually hear are, it tends to be kids who are at one extreme or the other, which I guess is one of the signs. If your kid is at one extreme or the other in terms of needs when they're a baby, that does tend to be a sign that something could be going on. Like they either are super low needs where they just, like Tessie and even Maggie as a baby. So Maggie would become a really high needs toddler, but for the first, 18 months of her life, she was a really low needs kid who just did her own thing. She didn't really need people at all. She sort of existed in her own world and so did Tessie. They didn't really need or want people into their spaces and that only would happen later. As long as their needs were met, they were pretty happy to just kind of do their own thing. Whereas Sadie was like our high, high, high needs baby that constantly, constantly cried and just needed us all of the time. The last sign that I'm gonna leave you with, I think this is number five, kind of threw that other one in there too, but five or six. The last sign for us with Tessie was that she did not respond to sound at all. As she got older, she didn't respond to her name, but this is way before that. This is farther back. Dogs barking really loudly right near her. Doesn't look bell ringing right next to her, head doesn't turn, 
brother screams, another brother fight ensues, doesn't bat an eye. Tessie might as well have been deaf, and there were suggestions that she was. I guess that when they first evaluated her, the people from early intervention went back and they that was what they said. They said she either has a major developmental delay or she's deaf because she's not responding to sound at all. And we went to the audiologist and honestly at the audiologist, I wondered how she could have even passed that thing because I didn't see her make any sort of response to the sounds. But I guess that the audiologist picked on some, up on some very small movements that she made. Okay, 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 okay. And was able to see that and was able, was able to tell. She does check in a lot now. I mean, not maybe a lot compared to other kids, but a lot compared to like what we used to be. That lack of response to sounds, that question, have you ever thought your child might be deaf? I didn't. I didn't think she might be deaf because I'd been a mom to her big sister. And so I knew, I knew what that lack of response meant for our family, for our genes. I knew it meant autism and that was fine. For someone who didn't have our family's background, their first thought might be hearing loss or a hearing problem. And so that can also be a really early sign of autism. And that is it for today. Those were the signs that we saw in Tessie when she was a little tiny baby. And it was really frustrating and it was hard waiting for her to be 18 months old to have that diagnosis because it was 18 months of waiting. It was 18 months of waiting for them to confirm what I felt like I knew all along, what I was really sure of all along, with people telling me that I couldn't know, and with people trying to reassure me the entire time. And to me, that reassurance, hi, you're bringing a chair over. Awesome, you're such a smart girl. And to me, that reassurance at times was really frustrating because I knew. If you have a child who's on the spectrum, how old were they when you knew? For us with Maggie, it was much, much older. I mean, she was three. And with Tessie, it was much, much younger. Huh. Oh, you're pretending to be my baby? You are my baby. Anyways, that is it for today. If you like this video, we would love it if you give it a thumbs up and if you're interested in all things autism, we'd love it if you'd hit subscribe. And I'll see you tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow. Huh, Tessie, can you say bye? Say bye. Good job. Good job saying bye like a big bye. Bye. <laughs>